In 2016, the Ministry for Primary Industries released a report informing fishermen about the potential risks from eating contaminated trout from 1080 poisoned rivers. It stated, MPI is of the opinion that any food safety risk can be mitigated if anglers are advised to avoid consuming trout from waterways in a 1080 drop area within seven days of the baiting operation. To help them form this opinion, the Ministry for Primary Industries used data from the 2014 Cawthron Institute study on rainbow trout. In the following video clip, Brett Power demonstrates that the MPI's opinion and the Cawthron Institute's research is dangerously flawed. So the Department of Conservation commissioned the Cawthron Institute in this paper here, report number 2611, 1080 uptake and elimination in rainbow trout. The purpose of that experiment is stated here on page one of that report. If we look down at paragraph three, page one, purpose, aims of the study were to develop a model to predict the uptake and fate of 1080 in trout flesh and two, to investigate the uptake and elimination of a known dose of 1080 in trout following ingestion of 1080 to validate the model. A total of 30 trout were included in the experiment. Eight trout were control fish, meaning they were not dosed with 1080 poison, but swam in the same tanks as the poison dosed fish. 22 trout were dosed with 1080 poison, each with the equivalent amount of poison that is contained in half a small sized 6 gram bait. OK, just looking at the uh, timeline for the fish and water sampling, uh, we go to page 5, figure 2, which shows um, when the trout were killed and tested for 1080, and also shows the start of the experiment with the 1080 dosing. And what this shows is, before the dosing, there were 30 fish trout to be used in the experiment. Before they'd even done the 1080 dosing, they killed five trout, control fish. This is before any 1080 dosing. So they were only left with 25 trout. They then did tests at six hours, so they took another four trout off, so they had 21 trout left. At 12 hours, they did another four so they had 17 trout left. At 24 hours, another four, so they had 13 trout left. At 48, another four, so they had nine trout left. And at 84, another set of four, so they got down to five trout left at the end, at 120 hours on the fifth day. And of those five fish, another two were taken out for control, as control tests, so that only left two at the end. 120 hours is five days only. It is stated in the report that five controls were killed before the feeding trial and two control fish were killed at the end of the experiment. 1080 concentrations in all control fish were below the method of detection limit of the assay. However, on page five, figure two of the report, the diagram shows that there were three control fish at the end of the experiment, not two and that two study fish dosed with 1080 poison remained. The Landcare research test results show that the five control fish killed at the start of the experiment tested negative for 1080 poison. However, the test results for the three remaining control fish at the end of the experiment shows that one of the control fish tested positive for 1080 poison residues. This outcome indicates that the researchers weren't aware of how many control fish remained at the end of the experiment or that they did not want to disclose that one of the controls became contaminated. The contaminated control trout test result was 30 times higher than the maximum residue limit set for pesticides in food, despite the water being partially changed at least three times. This undeclared outcome further complicates any assumptions made for an endpoint of 1080 contamination in trout. In the 2007 reassessment of 1080 poison by the Environmental Risk Management Authority, it was apparent that 1080 has a marked ability to spread and has been frequently found to contaminate experimental controls. I'll take the second document that I would like you to read, which is, uh, it was presented by the Ministry for Primary Industries on the 8th of October 2014. And it's called, How Safe is Trout to Eat if Caught in Areas Where 1080 Has Been Dropped? If we look down the bottom at the very last paragraph on that page, I will read it to you. It says, the current New Zealand maximum residue limits, which are called MRLs, 
standard for pesticides includes 1080 at 0 0.001 milligrams per kilogram of food. So that's the maximum level is 0 0.001 milligrams of contaminant uh, per kilogram of food. So if we now look at the results that the Cawthron Institute observed themselves in their own experiment. If we go to, at six hours, we can see that the level they measured was 2.4 milligrams 1080 per kilogram of trout flesh. That's 2,400 times above the maximum residual level for a pesticide or a poison in a food source. At 12 hours, it had gone up to 2,800 times above the maximum residual level. 24 hours, it was up to 3,800 times above the maximum residual value. Came down at 48 hours to 3,600 times above, and at 84 hours, it was 2,000 times above the maximum level, and at 120 hours, it had gone back up again to be 3,000 times above the maximum residual level for a poison or a pesticide in a food source. Next thing, um, I'd just like to talk about the loading that was used in the experiment. Repeatedly, throughout all these papers from Cawthron and Ministry of Primary Industries, they have stated that there was a, an excessively high loading of TN80 was used in this experiment. Uh, that's simply not true. And I'm going to refer to the document TN80 and Trout Flesh, brief comments in response to your inquiry from a Mr. Michael Beasley from the Ministry of Primary Industries. And he said the same thing. In the first paragraph here, when he was commenting on the Cawthron research trial, he said, this involved dosing of TN80 at very high levels, which is what they've repeatedly said throughout uh, the discussions and the reports. But if we look further down on the same paper that Michael Beasley has produced, we can go down to paragraph four, and I'll read what it says. On the other hand, you are correct in noting that the five milligrams of TN80 administered in the experiment is equivalent to just half a single 0.15% bait of 6.4 grams. So a 6.4 gram bait with a 0.15% loading, if you multiply that, you get nine mils. That's nine mils of TN80 in one of those baits, and they used half of that. So the actual loading was only equivalent to half of the TN80 that's in a 6.4 gram bait. And of course, that's the smaller of the baits. Dr. Michael Beasley, who provided the MPI response to questions about the Cawthron Institute trout study, was also the National Poison Centre representative that was involved with supporting the incorrect botulism diagnosis in the 2017 poisoned wild pig case which involved three members of the Cochiman family. Dr Beasley also noted in his poison trout study response that this, however, does not allow for the fact that humans may be, and indeed often are, more susceptible than experimental animals on a weight-by-weight -weight basis. So the reality is that the loadings were not high at all. They were actually minuscule loadings. And in a scenario where there's thousands of pellets dropped in the waterways with trout, what happens when the trout eats a whole single pallet, the loadings would be double this. So you'd be looking at levels in the trout of approximately 8,000 times above the maximum residual level permitted. 8,000 times above with one pallet. What happens if a trout eats three or four pallets? When aerial 1080 poison drops are undertaken in New Zealand, the poison bait is spread across running waterways at the same rate as the surrounding land areas. The toxin distribution flight charts, which anyone can obtain from the Department of Conservation, show exactly where the poison baits are spread. When the baits hit the water, they are immediately located and consumed by freshwater crayfish and other aquatic life. Uh, there's also on page one of this report a statement that residues 1080 were still detected after eight days in crayfish who had ingested bait containing 1080 after eight days. And that was in Surin and Bonnet, 2006. In 2006, Dr. Alistair Surin conducted an experiment on freshwater crayfish and found, even with low distribution rates, that the crayfish could encounter up to seven baits in their home range. I did this work in a simulated stream where I placed crayfish in small cages. 
and I fed them a mixture of their natural food and I put one 1080 bait in each cage. We found that the crayfish did eat the baits and that doesn't surprise me because a lot of crayfish growers actually feed their crayfish pellets in a similar way that 1080 is a pellet. On the Department of Conservation website it is stated that large trout love freshwater crayfish and so do shags. It also states that people collect and consume the crustaceans. In a recent news release it is stated that the rates of 1080 poison being spread across land and water may quadruple and that the tribe has endorsed the Fotara operation despite the fact that it will be using twice the normal 1080 sowing rate 4 kilograms of bait per hectare and may well do that twice depending on whether sufficient pests survive the first drop. These new aerial distribution rates equate to 1,333 6 gram baits per hectare of running water. I'll ask you to re refer to page 3 of the report and it's stated here uh, note 3 at the top it says in the absence of a 1080 half life value for trout it was assumed to be less than 11 hours based on data from mammals Eason 2011 that's Charles Eason who did the experiment and that experiment was done as a chronic exposure to 1080 over 120 days to determine the end point of contamination in rats. The effect of a contaminant on one species such as a rat, can, an end point of contamination cannot be applied to another species such as a mouse because species react completely differently to the same contaminant. Secondly, toxicity is dose dependent. You cannot take an experiment we use one six hundredth of the TN80 that was given to the trout and then apply the endpoint and contamination from that experiment on rats with one six hundredth the dose. You can't do that. That's toxicological fraud, in my opinion. What they did is they took a half life from Charles Eason's determination on rats and they said it was less than 11 hours. Now, they said that the contamination level that they used, uh, the, full, the full life of contamination well, would have been 22 hours, which was double the half-life of 11 hours. If you look at this graph at 22 hours, or at 24 hours, it's still 3,500 times above the maximum residual level. So their own data is in contradiction to what they're saying. They said that there was no other data to compare to. That's why they had to go to the rat experiment. But if we look at what they've said here themselves on page 10 under discussion, they said a study on trout found no visible effect at 4 milligrams 1080 per fingerling. This was Balmester 1977 and also at 8 milligrams per adult and that was Rammel and Fleming 1978. So there were other um, studies done on 1080 and trout. The 1080 dose used in this study that they did was about 600 times higher than the dose given in previous mammalian studies or mammal studies. Okay, uh, just returning again to page two. Unfortunately, no information on uptake or elimination rates of 1080 and trout was available when the model was developed. Well that's not true because they've referenced it in their own paper here on page 10. And it actually says here, no direct effect of this level of 1080 was ex expected or observed for the trout as they are known to be much less susceptible to the effects of 1080 than mammals. Looking at page 10 of the report under discussion paragraph 1. The LD50 for a number of mammalian species is less than one milligram per kilogram. That's the lethal dose required to kill 50% of the um, test animals. With the LD50 for 1080 in trout by injection is 50 milligrams per kilogram. They only gave the trout a tenth of that dosage in this. So they would have been aware of the resistance of trout to 1080 they would have known because these um, experiments have been done before.
Okay, so the big thing is uh, they make a point here in this report that no trout died from the ingestion of this 1080. That's because they're not susceptible to it. But that's not the problem. The problem is that they're carrying the 1080 and when they get caught by a fisherman or an angler, then they're consumed by a mammal, which is humans. And then it's a very, very big problem that there's 1080 because the, the humans will metabolise that 1080 into fluorocytrate. The mammals will do that, and that's the problem. And saying that it doesn't affect them, well, it's beside the point because other cold-blooded animals such as kura or eels, similarly, are not affected by the 1080 as warm-blooded mammals are. And they carry the 1080 for much longer periods as all the 1080 researchers have already discovered. While 1080 poison remains in a living animal, the poison is metabolised, including into a very toxic substance called fluorocitrate. Landcare Research, the institute that tested the trout for 1080 poison, stated that testing for fluorocitrate requires a separate analysis to the 1080 poison test. We don't have a validated test method for fluorocitrate in tissue. The very toxic metabolite, fluorocitrate, may be present in cold water fish and animals long after 1080 poison is no longer detected. In 2009, the Food Safety Authority was questioned about testing for 1080 poison in eels. The persistence of 1080 in cold-blooded animals has been known for many years. The New Zealand Food Safety Authority was asked whether they test eels destined for human consumption and export for 1080 residues. This is their reply. Due to the generally rapid breakdown of 1080 in the environment and dilution when 1080 hits water, any residue of 1080 in eels would be at such extremely low levels it would be undetectable. The New Zealand Food Safety Authority has therefore not undertaken such testing. So I would now like you to go to page 12 of the Cawthron report um, under conclusion. It's stated there that a large residue was measured in the trout flesh between 24 hours and 48 hours, and decreased after 84 hours. But this report does not even match the data that they have put in their graph on figure seven, page 10. Because if we look at that figure, if we look there, we will see at 84 hours, the level of 1080 contamination was 2,000 times above the maximum residual level. At 120 hours, it went up to 3,000 times the maximum residual level. The purpose of this experiment was to find the end point in contamination of the 1080 in the trout flesh. That was the purpose of this. But at the end of this experiment, with contamination levels going up, it was not possible to determine the end point because the experiment only went to 120 hours. It was stopped at 120 hours while the levels of contamination were going up. And basically, none of this data was used from here on in in the food safety assessment on trout. I will read to you now uh, from that same conclusion on page 12. Therefore, it was not possible to accurately determine the elimination rate. Our attempt to provide data to improve a model that could be used to extrapolate to other scenarios and for risk assessment purposes was unsuccessful. It was a failure. This whole experiment was terminated at 120 hours, which meant that there was no more measurement of the contamination in the trout. The ongoing contamination was totally ignored. So the next question is, if there was no determination of an end point of contamination, then how did the food safety assessment get done? Because if you don't know how long the 1080 remains in the trout, how can you do a food safety assessment? You can't. There was 1080 in Kura eight days after they were given them. Still massive dosages. And yet in this experiment, they only allowed for five days of testing because they didn't want to see the ongoing persistence of 1080 in the trout if they kept the experiment going. That's corrupt, total corruption in my opinion.
The 2016 MPI paper discusses pathways, but fails to consider a valid and most likely pathway for trout to be contaminated and with compounding doses of 1080 poison. That contamination pathway is freshwater crayfish. Freshwater crayfish immediately consume 1080 baits that land in water, day or night. A single crayfish can encounter and consume several baits over 24 hours and retain the poison for several weeks. A trout can encounter many contaminated kura during this time and accumulate dangerous levels of 1080 poison in its flesh. New information published by Aurelian, the government-owned company that imports and manufactures 1080 baits, shows that just a single 12-gram bait may kill a child. Please consider contacting the Minister for Primary Industries and the Minister for Conservation to request urgent action and to demand that an independent study into the long-term persistence of 1080 poison in trout and eels be commissioned. My name is Brett Power. I'm an engineering surveyor of uh, 25 years experience. I hold a degree in surveying. I studied pure mathematics, applied mathematics, statistical mathematics, spherical mathematics, astronomy and engineering at university. And then I uh, spent 25 years in the role of uh, senior engineering surveyor on some of the largest projects in the southern hemisphere is the Barrow Island gas plant. I also completed the Newman Hub. I was the senior surveyor um, working for MPD joint venture in a $2.5 billion project. Uh, my role was to check all the other survey parties and check the designs again, check the plans, check the calculations and make sure that all the computations were correct. So I've spent a lot of my time checking data and scientific papers, designs, and that's what I get paid a lot of money to do.